10. Hey, Luca. Yeah, I got one problem here. Oh, what's going on? I forgot the topic of this episode. Shame on me. Oh, you're kidding, right? Oh, yeah. Virtuoso, right? My shirt, the surroundings, that's it, huh? <laughs> yeah, if there's something you're not going to forget it, it should be this, man. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And that's the things back in track. Uh, this is episode six, live from Odison Showroom, the last episode of the OEMpedia webinar series. And thanks to you all for attending. We appreciate your commitment to learning and advancing. So let's talk about high fidelity sound for just a minute. Fidelity means the degree of exactness with which something is copied or reproduced. And some of us in car audio have been pursuing high fidelity for many years. Uh, stereo recordings, multi-way speaker systems with different drivers, uh, diamond styluses for our turntable cartridges, compact discs, high resolution audio. These are all things that have been invented and brought to market so that we could have better sounding music playback. Yeah, and back in the episode one, we talk about the C800, the very first car audio amplifier produced by Odison in 1982. And 10 years later came the HR100, so-called D amplifier from the Specialized Press. But there were also the LXR2 and the SXR2. And then came the complete SXR series. These were modern active crossover to comply with the growing demand for in-car high-end tuning functionalities. And please remember, most of the amplifiers in the market at that time were not having active controls on board. This uh, SX3 MT also included an advanced ambient function for its time. Odison has been always pursuing innovative solutions for car high fidelity for many years in amplifier, signal processor, and speaker too, of course. We talked a little bit in the last episode about how fragile analog waveforms are and how easily they can be damaged or distorted or changed accidentally. Uh, now, everything in the signal path, every part and every component can have some effect on the sound. Resistors, the transistors, the capacitors we choose. Uh, we know vacuum tubes change the sound. Uh, a lot of people like how vacuum tubes sound. And I know that guitar players will often choose a particular vacuum tube amplifier to give their instrument the sound that they like. Now, analog recordings, whether they're vinyl records or they're tapes, they leave out some information at the extremes uh, of the sound. And they add some noise to the background of the sound. We, we all know this. No one, no one can, can argue about this. But if you, what if you don't want to accidentally change the sound? That's the essence of high fidelity, where we're valuing the truth of the recording over the sensation that may just feel good. And so the idea behind Virtuoso is transparency. But no matter how hard we search for high fidelity, there are some other people trying to make money by trading the fidelity on the way to making things more convenient. And compact cassettes and low bit rate data compression files downloaded from Napster or satellite radio or low quality digital codecs feeding a Bluetooth speaker. These are all technologies which have attempted to trade some fidelity for some convenience. And what that means is that high fidelity sound at home is not easy. You have to find the right electronics and you have to find the right speakers and you have to set them up properly in the room. You have to make sure to sit in the right spot in the room. And you may even have to change the room so that the room sounds better. So if home high fidelity is hard, car high fidelity is much harder. Mm, right. We know we only have 12 volts power supply to work with. Right. We have size limitations and weight limitations and heat limitations. And the room we're sitting in is much worse for listening to music than most home listening rooms. It's tiny. The place we would like to put the speakers has a windshield in the way. Uh, we don't get to build a speaker enclosure with all the speakers in it. We have to find places to put the various speaker drivers, and then we have to nav navigate the limitations of the places that the speaker drivers fit. And on top of all that, we don't even get to sit in the right spot. But there are some high fidelity challenges that are shared between the home and the car. Yeah, and you're right. The idea behind Virtuoso is transparency. Glass is transparent, but low quality glass can distort the lights. 
High quality glass does not distort the light, but the highest quality glass is reserved for optical lenses, which focus the light without distortion. And um, virtuoso concept. A virtuoso was originally a highly accomplished musician. And I think uh, we don't have that on the screen. Uh, it's the next slide then. Uh, virtuoso again. Ah, there we go. Here we go. A virtuoso was originally a highly accomplished musician, but by the 19th century, the term had become restricted to performers, both vocal and instrumental, whose technical accomplishments were so pronounced as to dazzle the public. And uh, we have chosen a virtuoso in Mongol. His name is called Jasha Heifetz, one of the most influencing classical musicians of the last century, also known as the Fiddler of God. He stated that there is no top, that there are always further heights to reach. I believe this states very well the concept leading the project and development of the Odison Virtuoso. But I think it's now time to show you an emotional video. Yeah, and as our flagships, we incorporated into the Virtuoso electrical and mechanical design from everything we have learned. So correcting OEM signals, tuning the acoustic response, passing the music through an arm. Similarly, the software interface followed the Odison family layout, but it includes several improvements. The Virtuoso project was began after more than 10 years since the Bit1 announcement. We look at ways to deliver advanced functionality and highest end sonic fidelity. We use floating point DSP chipset in our flagship processor for the same reason that they are using professional recording studio equipment. They are capable of greater precision and that reduces quantization errors, which reduces noise. So let's talk about a specification for a minute. Uh, 10 Hertz to 44 kilohertz minus three dB is the frequency response specification for Virtuoso. So what does that even mean? Now, let me show you a couple of charts really quick. So does this signal go from 10 Hertz to 44 kilohertz? Oh, kind of. What about this one? Looks like. What about this one? The truth is we don't know because there is no vertical scale on these graphs. So we don't understand how big these deviations are. And if we don't understand the scale of the variations, then the specification number is meaningless. So here is a 10 Hertz to 44 kilohertz chart, but at the ends, it's 30 dB down at 10 Hertz and it's 30 dB down at 44 kilohertz. Now, if you're 30 dB down at the extremes, the fact that there's some energy there at those extremes doesn't matter. It, it just doesn't matter. This is not a, a honest way to specify a product. Now, here is a chart that shows from 20 Hertz to 20,000 kilohertz with a 3 dB variation. And that's the range that we've used to evaluate audio gear for a long, long time. Uh, the idea is that differences greater than 3 dB are very significant. They're really easy to hear because 3 dB is doubling the power to a speaker or having the power to a speaker. So this right here is a pretty good response. It's pretty flat between 20 and 20,000 Hertz. And that means that it's similar to what you get when you test good CD players. Uh, if you played a sound from a good CD player, it wouldn't change the signal very much between 20 Hertz and 20,000 Hertz. And we know CDs had better fidelity than anything that had come before them. Now here is 10 Hertz to 44 kilohertz 
with only 3 dB of variation at the extremes. This is a much, much better frequency response that doesn't alter the sound. And this is the frequency response of Virtuoso. Yeah, and this frequency response is beyond CD quality. It is good enough to be certified high resolution audio. Virtuoso uses audio file grade analog and digital components and an advanced design to deliver unheard audio performances. And our test measurements are always conducted to industry standard specifications. We mentioned the frequency response is 10 hertz, 44 kilohertz, and minus 3 dB. Audio standard is 20 to 20 kilohertz. Distortion is only 0.004%. That is a four thousandths of a percent. Signal to noise ratio is 104 dB on the main input, 110 dB for optical. Keep in mind the CD standard theoretical maximum is 98 dB. It has 80 dB of channel separation, where 30 dB is the analog reference under, and delay is adjustable in 0.0. 0.04 milliseconds, that means 1.4 centimeter or 0.6 inches increments due to high sampling frequency rate. The circuitry for Virtuoso is new and optimized to a state of the art grade. The capacitors, the operation amplifiers, and the digital to analog converters have been carefully selected to match with the high level audio grade components. And we want you to know more about this wonderful audio component so you can use it in your business. Ken, would you start us off? Sure, I would be happy to. So today's objective for this section, uh, when I'm done, I would like you to have an idea of how to use D-phase, which is a unique feature of Virtuoso. I'd like you to understand the benefits of FIR mode, which is a unique feature of Virtuoso. And when we're done, hopefully, you'll want to put one of these in your own car. Hmm. So when we talk about this as a bit processor, I'm gonna use the same formula that we used in the last episode to talk about all the bit processors. Let's talk about the inputs first, and then we'll talk about the outputs, and then we'll talk about other things that are inside here. So I think the input side of the bit virtuoso is really impressive. And the first thing I want to emphasize is that it can handle 32 volt input signals. And that makes it one of the only DSPs that I know of that can handle the signal from high voltage amplifiers, such as the BMW. The most common one people see is a BMW top hi-fi system that has eight ohm woofers under the seat, because that means it's gonna have 30 volts or more of base channel voltage. Yeah, and the input sampling rate is incredibly high. So that consumers who are using high resolution sources, we get that signal all the way through. Now, in past episodes, we've talked about Audison's universal speaker simulation technology. And USS simulates OEM speakers so that when you disconnect the speaker wires from the speaker and connect it to the bit processor, the OEM system doesn't mute the output and it doesn't trigger any diagnostic error codes or warning lights. And the Virtuoso has 12 input channels, so there's a lot of flexibility in how you set it up. You can use the standard mode or you can use the pass-through mode. We'll talk about pass-through mode more in a moment, but right now this is standard mode and you can set it up for up to 12 channels. Now here we have active three-way fronts, we have active two-way rears, we have a center channel, and then we have a sub-channel all coming into Virtuoso and that adds up to 12 channels of input. Oh wow. You can also That's configure cool. it slightly differently if you go to pass-through. Yeah, that's a lot of speaker channels. And also remind the Virtuoso has analog auxiliary and two TOSLink inputs. And I've been asking several times why two TOSLink inputs. Well, we can use one with external digital preamp for an OEM source and the other one with an high resolution player. Both are 192 kilohertz sampling and 24 bit depth. So they are both high resolution certified. Some people ask if this level of SPD if input support is necessary. And the attraction to us is that most of the master recording are made at 96 kilohertz, 24 bit. Since we are concerned with fidelity and accuracy, we are attached to the concept of preserving the original format as part of possible through the system. The analog aux, if you use it, also has the eye sampling rate on its analog to digital conversion. So the Virtuoso has three different modes of OEM signal correction. There's DEQ, there's D-time, and there's D-phase. 
and DEQ is Audison's name for the process of undoing OEM audio equalization. It's basically reverse equalization to get the signal back close to flat. And that's the goal of DEQ, to get it close to flat so that we know the signal is all complete. Then we will do our acoustic tuning afterward. And bit processor always have output EQ, so you can fine tune the results. Absolutely. Now the Virtuoso goes beyond just an output EQ, and we'll talk about those more in a moment. But back to correction. The D time feature will measure and correct any delay that has been applied by the OEM pro uh, processing. Now this is not as common as I was afraid it was going to be a few years ago. It turned out of what, uh, that some of what we were seeing a few years ago was not delay. It was actually phase processing. And that brings up a, a unique aspect of virtuoso, <laughs> which is, there we go. Um, phase correction of the signal. Now, do you remember this graph? You of course this graph, <laughs> this came from almost every episode of OEMpedia. We've looked right. at a version of this graph. And this is what happens if you play mono pink noise through both door speakers and you sit in either front seat of a car, you will get big dips in the frequency response from either front seat. And these dips are phase cancellations that happen at the listening positions. And phase cancellations happen if the two different sounds that are adding together are nearly 180 degrees apart. Now we've mentioned in the past that some OEM systems will equalize the phase to try to partially address some of these dips. So I'm gonna walk you through the process when I bench tested the phase correction on a 2018 Toyota Tacoma base audio head unit. And first thing I did was I measured with my handheld RTA, I measured the left and right response coming out using pink noise. And you can see the frequency responses of the front channels are full range, they don't match. There is different equalization applied to the left and the right, but they are both full range. So watch what happens when I safely sum the left and the right together. Now, in order to do that, you're gonna to need to have some kind of line output converter, or you need to use the outputs of your DSP processor. And that's what I did here. See this huge dip here? What does that mean? Well, it'll make more sense when I take that door speaker cancellation chart that we just saw, and I lay it over this chart. You notice anything now? So what this means is that Toyota, or more likely their audio supplier, knew that at the listening positions, these acoustic signals would be out of phase at this frequency. So they flipped the phase of the electrical signal 180 degrees right there. Now, the sounds from these two speakers, after they travel the distances in the car, will be back in phase at your ears. If you test them electrically, you aren't getting the delay from the path lengths to the various speakers. So you can see that cancellation like this. Now you can also just listen to the car. If you go back to what we talked about in episode two, you can use a simple listening test to hear the results, which are centered mid bass that is stronger at this frequency because the phase cancellation has been gone. And if you missed episode two, you can go back and watch it on Audison's YouTube channel. So this isn't just happening in the Toyota Tacoma. We have had re reports of similar results in the Camry and the RAV4. We've seen some Subarus, we've seen some Hyundais and some Kias. So this is pretty common and, and we should be prepared for it. Now, so several times in this series, I've talked about using the OEM phase equalization, ways to incorporate it into our upgrade. Uh, but we know that phase processing like this is only a partial solution. We know it doesn't solve all the cancellations. It doesn't solve all the problems caused by path length differences in the car. So now what we're gonna do with Virtuoso is completely get rid of the phase mismatch. And once we've done that, we can use delay, which corrects all of the problems of path length differences and get the best one seat performance that we can get. So when you're using Virtuoso and you wanna correct phase, it is a part of the OEM equalization correcting process. So I'm gonna walk you through correcting both. So it might seem like we have a number of steps because we are doing both processes. So right here, 
you can see if you're starting from scratch, there's two ways to do it. You can select the IO in a configuration wizard right here, or if you just want to configure the inputs and not both the inputs and the outputs, you can select input configuration wizard. From there, it's the same process for the inputs. Now here, you want to make sure that you have checked master delay polarity check and master DEQ phase alignment when you do this. Now, when I, I went ahead and unchecked aux and the optical inputs, I'm only using high level. Now here, I get to define how many channels I'm bringing into Virtuoso. Now for the simplicity of the demo, I only brought in left and right front. And you can see here, I've defined the left and the right as full range signals. Right. So now I get to hit next and it says insert installation CD into the vehicle CD player. Now we know not all cars have CD drives anymore. So you should make sure ahead of time to have the calibration tracks downloaded to a USB drive. If you download them to a USB drive, you have to make sure they stay in the same order because the instructions on the software will tell you to play different numbered tracks and you better know that they correspond to the CD, but they are available for download on the Audison website. It's also important to remember, set your tone controls to zero, set the balance and fader to zero, and remember that you wanna pay attention to your volume setting also. So with only two channels, this did not take long at all. I think it took a minute or two. Then when it's done, it'll pop you into the input level setup window. And the input level setup window has three things that you should know about. The first one is it has clip lights for each individual channel. So if you are getting into clipping on any particular channel, you can see it very clearly here. The next thing you should know is that it has low signal warning lights if yeah. you don't get any signal from a channel. And that may mean that we forgot to hook it up or that we had a bad connection. So it's really useful to be able to see that for every channel down here. And then the third thing is the reference level for the sensitivity. On the right, you can see that it defaults to reference, and then it has a 3 dB and a 6 dB headroom setting, which will get you extra output. And you know your customers, so you know which customers may need a little extra headroom. Now, once again, we're gonna hit next, and we're gonna test delay and polarity. You have to play track three at this point. I, when the first time I set this up, I kept playing track two. You have to pay attention, play track three. So it didn't take very long. And then it gave me this window. And what this told me is that at the top here, master delay compensation is not necessary. They, it confirmed there was no delay applied to the left and the right channels. Down here, it confirmed that I hooked up left and right correctly. Now, it's really important that you hook up left and right correctly because as some of you know, if you accidentally flip polarity on one of the inputs, suddenly you have no base and you can't tune anything and it's a big problem. So Virtuoso makes sure that we got this part right. But I did want to confirm that I was a little skeptical. I wanted to make sure that this worked properly. So I ran this process again after flipping positive and negative on one side. And you can see here, it caught me. It warned me that I have channel one polarity flipped. And there's two options I have at this point. One of them is automatic polarity correction. You can check it here. The other one is manual polarity correction. You know what manual polarity correction means? It means, hang on a minute, I'm gonna go fix my wiring. Now, if you check that, it means you better go fix your wiring because from this point forward in the process, it will assume you did. And also it's the right way to send the car to the customer. You don't want to ever upgrade that car or troubleshoot it later and forget that you hook two wires up backwards, right? This is a really useful feature. So now we're gonna de-equalize the OEM source. And when we get to this window, we're gonna use track two. Now we get to use track two. Make sure you go down here and click on enable phase analysis or it won't do phase analysis. It took a minute. Now it wants to know if we want to enable phase compensation. You do, hmm. and now you get this display. And this is different from what you've seen in other bit uh, software. What this does is it tells us the response of the signal that was coming in from the Toyota radio, 
and what it applied and then the result. So the yellow line here is the signal from the Toyota radio. The blue line here is the DEQ that was applied. And the orange line here is the result. Now, when I first saw that orange line, I didn't think it was an actual result. I thought that it was just the center line in the graph because it was too perfectly flat. Um, let me assure you that it's not always perfectly flat. This was just a really good result. Um, sometimes you will see some variation there and that's okay because the purpose of DEQ is to get it flat enough to tune using the output EQs. So what about phase? Well, you see up here at the top, there's a switch that says module and that's the default position, but you can slide it over to suggested all pass. Well, all pass filters are how we equalize phase. So if you want to see what all pass filters the unit suggests, you click that button. And boom, it changed what it's showing you. And see this area down here with the big green circle? What that says is at the end of this wizard process, we suggest you fine tune the master all pass filters. And there's sort of a hint up here of what this yellow rectangle is, but we'll talk about that more in a moment. So after this, you're done. And notice down here, it says remove the installation CD. Apparently, Audison knows how many CDs I've left yeah, in right. customer cars <laughs> over the years. So now we're back to the main window of the software. But how do we do the fine tuning? <clears throat> well, you see the EQ window right here. If you go up to the upper right corner of that window, you see that little arrow? If you click on that arrow, it pops out with the whole equalizer window. And I think this is a really great innovation for the Virtuoso software because I think equalization is really important. And I really like how they're giving you a bigger UI window to perform equalization. And if you look down here, it has defaulted to the channel EQ. And the channel EQ is the same EQ that's in every other bit processor. But this one has a few other options. Let's click on input EQ. Now, when you click on input EQ, you can see that it's giving you a manual EQ to, to fine tune the inputs, but it also has a button here that says all pass filter. Well, let's click on that button. Boom. You see that same similar or the similar display, but we have a couple of lines here. And I've gone ahead and clicked up in this upper right hand corner on phase on off. And the reason I clicked on phase on off is I wanted to see the effect of this all pass filter that was recommended. Now, if you look down here in the lower left for a minute, you will see that it explains to you a blue rectangle is a first order all pass filter. And a first order all pass filter goes from zero degrees to 180. And a yellow rectangle is a second order all pass filter. And a second order all pass filter basically goes from zero degrees to 180 and all the way back to zero degrees functionally. So look down here, you can see that the blue line is showing us the left and the right sum. And you can see you can select what channels you're summing together. But here we're summing front left and front right. And you can see right here, there's a huge hole. And we kind of saw that already on my RTA. Now, because I've turned on the all pass filter, it's showing you the orange line where the huge hole is gone. Now, is it perfectly flat? It is not. But is the big hole gone? Yes, it is. So that means the left and the right are close enough to zero degrees phase that we can proceed with our tuning. Now, the one piece of advice that I will give you here is that you don't need a perfectly flat response before you start to tune, but the input EQ allows you to fine tune the result if you're looking for the best possible result. And so at the end, I went ahead and took my RTA and I hooked it up so I could confirm I was getting the results that I liked. And what you're gonna see here, oh, I forgot to show you this. When you want to fine tune the all pass filter, you hold the control button down on your laptop and you will get this display, which I've made a little bit larger so it's easier to read. It tells you the center frequency of this all pass filter, where this dot is. It tells you the phase where this dot is. And you can change that by holding the control button and using the arrow keys. And it also shows you the Q. Now the Q means the bandwidth as you may remember, and that is how wide 
the rectangle is, and it's also how many notes on each side of the rectangle are affected by the all-pass filter. So you can screw around with that to your heart's content to see how flat you can get the orange line. Now, if you decide that the rec original recommendation was the best, but you don't remember what it was, you can take your cursor down here to the restore button down at the bottom, and you can click on restore, and it will put the all-pass filter back to the originally recommended configuration by the software. Now, cool. when I was all done with this, I wanted to check and see how flat I had gotten the response. And I will admit this result, I did use the input EQ to tweak it just a little bit more, but you can see the hole from the original measurement is gone. And so is the roller coaster. So the input section really did correct, not just the amplitude, but it also allowed us to correct the phase. Now, some of you may wonder, how do you preserve the phase? What if you want to keep the OEM processing instead of undoing it? Yeah, well, when would you want to do that? I can think of two different situations where I might want to do it. One of them is a multi-channel up mixer system, which we've talked about in previous episodes. And the other one is a two-seat phase equalized system, uh, which we also have talked about in previous episodes. So if I go to the pass-through mode at the beginning of this process. And here, let me zoom in a little bit here. You can see I've configured this one to take in three-way active fronts, plus rears, plus two-way active centers, plus surround rears. And that maxed out 12 channels. If I needed to have a subwoofer in, I would need to get rid of one channel and that would probably be by summing the center externally or something. Um, you can add a 13th output for a subwoofer if you want uh, uh, on the output side. Now, when you use pass-through, there's no de-equalization process applied. There's no summing, there's no crossovers. You're using the factory crossovers. You do have output equalization available and level to fine tune the system. And this one is perfect for both large upmix systems and phase process systems that have a lot of output channels. All right. So we've talked about the inputs and what makes them different. Let's talk about the outputs for a moment. And too. So here's the window where you configure the outputs. And the first thing you do is define what they are. And you do that by clicking on which speakers you have. And you can, you can see here that the system is capable of supporting a four-way active front, front stage. Um, the processor has 13 output channels if you're running it in the standard IIR mode. If you go to the FIR mode, it will only have nine channels. Um, that's because of the, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. It does support two-way active centers, which I'm a big fan of two-way active centers whenever you can use them. So it has a couple of different parametric equalizers. We've talked about that already. Now it's different than the parametric equalizer in the Prima series, because here you really do have full control. By the way, when you're using the Virtuoso software, there's no more standard mode or expert mode. So congratulations, if you're using Virtuoso, you're an expert. <laughs> but when you're in IIR mode, it has 12 bands of EQ. Now an improvement to the software is that there are also 12 bands in FIR mode. Nine of them are FIR bands. Three of them are IIR bands. Those are restricted to the base. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Down here, you can see the crossover selection is really broad. Uh, in standard mode, we have 6 dB to 48 dB crossover filters, and we can select Butterworth or Bessel or my favorite, Linkwitz Riley. Now, if you set it up in FIR mode, you can also go up to 48 dB per octave filters and have zero phase effects because the FIR filters don't follow any of those standard topologies that we got from the analog world, and they don't have phase side effects. And we'll talk about more about that in a minute. Now, let's talk about the channel EQ again. Now here I've set it up to be able to tune the front channel, but you could also, the, the front stage, but you could also tune the rear stage or the subwoofer or the center channel independently. Now, the lower the frequency, the longer it takes to process with FIR. So Audison has used IIR bands for the base frequencies so that we minimize the amount of time it takes the signal to pass through the virtuoso. Now, the smart user interface predicts the interactions between these bands really nicely. And I really want to explain how this works because I didn't understand it. So let's say that we set two bands opposite each other. One is going up 11 dB and one is going down 11 dB. 
That's probably not a great idea, but let's just experiment with this for a minute. Now let's move them toward each other. And you'll notice that when they get to a certain point, they don't look the same. I'm not doing what I asked them to do anymore. Now the UI down at the bottom here still shows 11 dB of attenuation, but the graph doesn't show 11 dB. So I thought you told me this was a software that would do exactly what I wanted it to do. What's going on? Yeah, right. Well, it does. But now we're getting the benefit of a real user interface instead of just dumb control knobs. The values at the bottom of this window tell you what you have set the filters to do. The graph tells you what happens when you do it. If you set two bands of a parametric equalizer really close together, and then you ask for a 22 dB swing between the filters, you're not going to get it. They will affect each other and fight each other and prevent what you have requested from actually happening. And this is true with every parametric EQ in the world that will let you put two bands close together. So this is just what you did. It's doing exactly what you did. But other DSP user interfaces may let you believe you're getting what you asked for. Virtuoso is going to show you what really happens. Um, and the Audison engineers didn't just calculate the results mathematically. They actually confirmed this with connecting analyzers to the output of Virtuoso, and they tested a bunch of different equalizer configurations to make sure that the software would guide you to what you will actually receive if you try something like this. So if you do, if you jam two bands really close together and go with a 22 dB swing between them, and it, it shows you you're not going to get it, you might want to think about it a little bit more and reconsider what you're asking for. Now, I've been asked a few times, why would you have output EQs and then add a main EQ? Well, I'm going to explain to you how I use these when I tune a car. There are two big things that I use equalization for when I tune a car. And the first one might be a surprise to you. I use it to make the left and the right match. And that's what's going to give you the best stereo imaging. Even if left and right are not perfectly flat, even if there are deviations that I would like to have gotten rid of and I couldn't, if they match, the imaging will be consistent and I won't have instruments floating back and forth toward whichever speaker is louder at a particular note. The, the second thing I use equalization for is tonality, which is the overall sound of the system. Now, in the tuning process, once I have the left and the right matching, any equalization that I apply to change the sound of the system should affect both sides equally. Otherwise, I screw up my matching, right? So when you're tuning the system, use the output equalizer to make the left match your target curve as well as possible, and then make the right match your target curve as well as possible, and then use the main EQ to make any additional tonal changes because it'll affect left and right and front and rear and sub and all of that. So let's talk about phase management on the outputs for a minute. There are three kinds of acoustic phase interactions uh, from speakers. And one of them comes from center stage content, which comes from left speakers and right speakers at the same time. Yeah, right. And in system of this performance level, we use delay to correct the phase interactions between the left and the right speaker signal at the listening position. And as we talked about, before you can use delay, you have to make sure left and right are in phase at all frequencies. It doesn't have to be zero, but they have to match phase left and right at all frequencies. The second source of phase cancellations is the transition band between two adjacent drivers, like a mid and a tweeter, where they overlap. And usually, when we're setting up a system, we will manage this with proper delay settings and proper crossover settings. And the Virtuoso gives you one more tool. All pass filters in the transition band, which automatically track your crossover point. And this is the first order all pass filter. And this is a second order all pass filter. So the third place that you can get cancellations from is reflections inside the cabin. Well, we can do anything about that other than depending on our specialist to put the speakers in the best possible locations. Okay, that's the output side. Now let's talk about the other stuff. FIR mode is the cornerstone of Virtuoso. We use FIR computation on the inputs and the outputs. 
ever since the introduction of digital audio back in the 80s, I've been reading about the opportunity to have digital filters that would not shift phase. But every filter I've seen for decades has just been a digital imitation of the analog filters. So let me show you something about how analog filters work. If you have in the top chart, you can see here, we have a high pass and a low pass crossover. And then we have a red line that shows how they're summing together just fine. You have a flat response all the way across. But if you measure the phase of that speaker system, you can see that it's starting out at zero degrees here and it has shifted a lot all the way through. So analog crossovers make this sort of shift and so do digital crossover filters that use IIR computation, which is all the DSPs, all the digital crossovers we've ever seen. Now that's crossovers, what about equalization? Same deal. You can see in this chart on the top, we have used an equalizer to cut at 80 Hertz and we have boosted at 700 Hertz. And then if we measure the phase, it starts out at zero and then it does this big whoop de doo before it gets mm -hmm. back to zero, way high in the trouble. And that is caused by analog filters and it's caused by digital crossover filter or digital equalizer filters using IIR computation. Now, part of the reason for this is that pro audio guys or recording engineers, they didn't wanna change the tools that they used. They wanted the same sonic character from the tools they had used for many years. But another reason for this is that the math involved in doing filters that don't have phase shift is completely different and it was much harder to do. And most hardware wasn't capable of supporting that level of computation. So as we've mentioned before, in order to support FIR computations, the Virtuoso uses a floating point DSPIC that is the same model that is used in much pro audio studio recording gear. Yeah, and with Virtuoso, some processing is always performed in FIR mode, but others require you to set up the processor initially in FIR mode. When you make this selection, fewer output channels are available due to the computational overhead required for FIR. Now you can see in these graphs that using FIR computations, phase is not affected. Here are the crossover filters. And here is the equalization. Now, Using FIR does not magically remove any phase issues that are happening at the listening position. You still have a complex audio system we're installing and tuning. And once sound gets back into the acoustic realm, we've talked about how phase interactions will come back, of course. Okay, but Virtuoso also uses a revolutionary algorithm never before used in cars, the Percept Room Correction. Percept handles all correction at once. Acoustic and electrical are performed at the same time. It works together with the B-Tune. It takes the original OEM signal and passes it through to the complete signal chain. Then it makes one set of FIR mode calculation for the best possible result. Eliminates multiple redundant correction processes. It is based on advanced room correction algorithms. Remember, it only works in conjunction with the B-Tune and FIR mode. Uh, hey, Luca, don't forget full DA HD. Right. So what is full DA HD? Let's start from the full DA. With most DSP processors, the signal that comes from the processor IC is sent to an analog to digital converter and it's sent in the analog domain to the amplifier, usually over an RCA cable. So we have mentioned a few times what can happen to analog electrical signals traveling in the car environment. So the first full D amplifiers has advanced digital to analog converters inside. You could send the digital signal from the bit processor to the full D amplifier. So it was very immune to noise and distortion using your, our own cables. The distance the analog signal had to travel was only centimeters and all on the printed circuit board inside the amplifier. Well, Full DHD now uses high resolution capable digital to analog converters. If you connect them to Bit Virtuoso, the signal is high resolution digital all the way into the amplifier. Full DHD compatible devices are CTO, the Bit Virtuoso, of course, Voce amplifiers with AV between HD module inserted, 
AV 5.1 KHD amplifier, an old thesis amplifier line. So to benefit from the full D architecture, you really should use the DRCMP as your system controller. That allows the output of the amplifier to be directly controlled by the volume knob. And fortunately, the Virtuoso has the DRCMP included in the kit. The Virtuoso also has a remote volume adjustment, RVA as we call it. it lets you control the system volume from the OEM controls, even though the source isn't on the OEM system. A special tone is required and setup in the software is needed. We don't have time to go through all that at the moment, but it's really a great concept. There's also an advanced version of the dynamic or the variable EQ feature, first introduced in the bit one. The variable EQ settings works like this. Define your low volume EQ, define your high volume EQ, change the volume with DRC or RVA, and the EQ cure will progress from one to the other in a linear fashion. I think that's a really cool feature. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention. There are some hardwire control inputs that let you perform some functions that are also available on the DRC. Uh, you can switch between optical and analog inputs, and you can switch between preset. And the reason for this is that some installations may not lend themselves to reaching the DRC very easily. And so talented fabricators can come up with many different ways to change the input using a wire when you connect your high resolution player. And, and you can change the tuning preset the same way. I know I've worked on convertibles where we've set up the top up, top down position switch to actually change the tuning preset of the system automatically for the customer. So it was always tuned for the way they were using the car. You could also set it up to pass from, uh, set up from pass-through mode for a multi-channel for two seat to a one seat tune with delay just by pressing a button. Now, there is one feature I want to show you here that I feel like is really for North America. Let's <laughs> see here. Da, da, da. This one is something that I think some of my friends will really like. And what happens when the customer listens to the car and says, I really like it, but I want more bass? Yeah, that's typical. So, huh? <laughs> here you go. There is a bass boost equalization management window in Virtuoso with parametric control of bass boost. You can control the center frequency, you can control the gain, and you can change the width of the boost without touching any of the other settings that you've spent all this time on. In conclusion, music has been very democratic. At one time, only rich people could afford to hear music perform in their homes. Then public performance started to bring music to the general populace. But now we can hear recorded music nearly anywhere. But where can we hear this music alone and without interruption and at the volume we like better than in our cars? This is where we started with signal processing, the SXR2. And this is where we have arrived. Virtuoso, the finest automotive processor in the world. And as usual, we have covered a lot of information. And now we have arrived at the question and answer section. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the page to interact with us live. So we did it, Ken. Let's see how many curiosities. All right. We got so, some yeah. already. So does it just have a global front EQ or does it have individual driver EQ, Mitchell Volos, Susking? It doesn't have individual driver EQ like a bit 10. It has a front EQ and then it has a rear EQ and then it has a center EQ. So if you're looking to tune within the stop band of one speaker and not affect the stop band of the other speaker, it's not going to allow you to do that. Ideally, at this level, it would be good to choose speakers that are fairly linear in their stop band, and then that is much less of a concern. Okay. So guys, anyone else? Pull up your curiosity. Scott Harrell is asking, after I updated my bit one, why wouldn't my bit in HDs not work? Well, it's tough to say from here, but what I would do is, is check the serial numbers with the 
the Audison distributor in, in your area to confirm that they are compatible because there are some serial number uh, confirmations you need to make to make sure that, yes. that they are there compatible. Might, there might be a need to, to upgrade the firmware as well. So any other query, curiosity, whatever we have before we let you go for your Thanksgiving? How will I match the acoustic slopes without this feature? Well, I'm not an engineer, Mitchell, so I can't comment on whether anything can be added in the future. But like I said, if you actually select drivers that are linear in the stop band, then you're not going to have to try to fix it later. So Travis is saying, uh, so many questions. I need to play around with the software more than ask. So yeah, that's a good idea. And uh, sure, anything you need, Travis, we're here for you. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us, Travis. Thanks uh, Travis for question, yeah. and thanks, Holger. Yeah, Travis is attending from, uh, from, from Australia, so late night over there. Mm. Have a good night then. Ciao, Holger. Happy to see you again. Thank you for, for staying with us. I don't Be think there's a video right now on tuning with a bit processor. Um, that's probably something that we can put on the project list to look at in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why not? Thanks. And I, 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 Billy, I think, as I recall, you are in the U.S. And I would check and see with uh, the U.S. Uh, Electromedia guys to see if they can uh, give you some support on that. Maybe I can help out with you guys directly, too. Uh, thanks, Mark. Have a, have a nice Thanksgiving, you. Thank you. Enjoy. And Luis from Portugal. Great show, Luke and Ken. Thank you for all the info. Thank you for staying with us, Luis. All right. So, um, let's see. Uh, I want to show the email for the next coming uh, questions, Ken. We are always yeah. here and we have uh, your passing. And uh, we're always available at support at electromedia.it if you have uh, any question during uh, the next days or the next months, the next weeks or whatever, you can contact us at this. And uh, now before closing this fantastic series, we have a surprise, an award to be given to the most loyal attendee. And I would like to introduce you the one and only Grant Rogers, owner of Bespoke Audio, specialist shop located in Johannesburg, South Africa. How are you, Grant? Now you can talk. Can I talk? Uh, yeah. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, we know? do hear you. All... How are you? <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. All good. All good. Enjoying the, enjoying the, the video, enjoying uh, the information that you guys are giving um i hope there's there's going to be more um and yes yes it's 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 been good it's really but if, good if you if you ask us for we'll do more uh <laughs> looking at your tendency it looks quite interesting so how did you like this series i loved it there, there was a lot of information that uh we're not we don't really get you know being in in, in south africa we are our sources are quite limited so um yeah, it's 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 really nice getting all this information that we can we can now use and and understand how things are working better. Mm. What would you like to see more? How could we improve and keep going with the formats? On your opinion, uh, my opinion, teach me how to use my bit tune to the best of my ability of 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 everything it can do. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's, that's, that, that is going to be possibly one of the next steps. So stay tuned, okay? And by right. the way, now that OMP day is over, what will you do? I don't know. I'm going to... Business, harder. okay? Business. <laughs> <laughs> so Grant, uh, of course. we will be receiving a bit nove. Okay, it's a gift. Oh. There's a special reward for watching all the episode entirely. Wow, man. Wow, wow, wow. We handle it to you by our South African national distributor enjoying 
Audison Technology and thanks for your virtual attendance. And by the way, you will have a, a bonus of three questions on the parametric equalizer of the bit novel to ask <laughs> Ken. Okay? Oh, perfect. <laughs> yes, I'll give you my home phone number. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> okay, okay. Now, going back to the this, and uh, before I forget, the Thanksgiving to all uh, to all the attendees, and uh, and I would like to thank also all the other attendees that has followed us during this and any other episode. Don't forget, you will have the replays on the Audison YouTube channel, and differently from the other episodes, this episode will going to be replayed tomorrow. Um, uh, stay tuned for the next Electromedia live events. There's a lot to come more. Now, sadly, it's really time to go. Ciao dall'Italia. Farewell from the U.S., guys. Thanksgiving, everyone. Bye. Bye.